Jack is on his way to Margaret's house party. He is phoning her for directions. First, you will have some time to look at questions one to five. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be repeated. Jack has got lost on his way to Margaret's party. He is phoning her for directions. Hello, is that Margaret? Yes, who's speaking? Margaret, it's Jack. I think I'm lost. I can't see a signpost. Jack, and... so where are you now? Well, I'm a bit confused about the directions, but I'm at a T-junction. Jack says he is at a T-junction, so you choose C at a T-junction. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. First... You have another chance to look at questions one to five. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Jack has got lost on his way to Margaret's party. He is phoning her for directions. Hello, is that Margaret? Yes, who's speaking? Margaret, it's Jack. I think I'm lost. I can't see a signpost and... Jack, so where are you now? Well, I'm a bit confused about the directions, but I'm at a T-junction. What can you see around you? I can see a pub on the corner. Can you see the name of the pub? Wait a minute, let me see. It's hard to see in the dark. Yes, I can read it now. It's called the Lion's... Mm, head. Oh, the Lion's Head. OK, well, then you're not too far away. Go straight ahead through the traffic lights to the next T-junction. Sorry, I didn't hear you. What did you say? I said just go through to the next T-junction. OK. Now what? Well, there's a park in front of you and a large two-storey building on the corner. Ah, uh, yes, I can see them. OK, so now turn left. Hang on. You're coming up the street, so you'll have to turn right. OK, got it. What's the name of your street? It's Wesley Street, W-E-S-L-E-Y, number 70. We're the fifth house on the left. You should see a red letterbox and some bushes in front of the house. OK, fifth house, number 70. I should be there soon. Am I late for the party? It sounds like things are happening there. No, it's only just started. That's good. I should be there in the next ten minutes. See you soon. Jack hangs up and walks on. Seven minutes later, he calls Margaret again, as he still can't find the house. You now have some time to look at questions six to ten. As you listen, answer questions 6 to 10. Who's speaking? Hi, Margaret. It's Jack again. Sorry to bother you. Listen, would you mind doing me a favour? Of course. What? Could you tell Mike I have got his camera? I've tried to send him a text message, but it's not going through. Oh, he's not here yet. Oh, dear. He said he'd be there early. He might be lost too. OK, I'll call him. What's his number? 0482-563379. Oh, so that's 0485? No, no, 0482-563379. OK, I'll call him right away. But where are you now? Well, I'm in your street, but I still can't find your house. I can't see the numbers very clearly, or a red letterbox. It's pretty dark. 
I thought you said it was easy to find. Oh, okay. Wait there. I'll come outside and get you. All right then. And don't worry about calling Mike. I'll try to call him now. Hang on. There's someone coming down the street. It looks like Mike. Oh, and I can see the letterbox now. It was hidden behind a bush. See you soon. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 2. Section 2. You are going to hear a lecture about the Miner's Hotel. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 11 to 14. Good evening and welcome to the Minor Hotel. We are pleased to have you as our guest. I will give you a brief information session to tell you everything you need to know to make this a pleasant stay. The Minor Hotel was built in the 1850s, during the Gold Rush period, also nicknaming our state the Golden State. People from all over the country and even from other countries came to seek their fortune here in these hills, creating cities overnight. In this city, many gold rush hotels soon opened up. This particular hotel was built in 1851, but was destroyed during an earthquake. It was rebuilt in 1995 to recreate the feel of the gold rush, complete with articles and actual photographs from during the 1850s. Our hotel is divided into two buildings, one called the Gold Tower, and the other is named the Fortune Tower. You will be staying in the Fortune Tower on the 25th floor, complete with great views of the city. Your room is the best room in the hotel, complete with private living room and hot tub. Here is your room card. On the card it will say FT, meaning Fortune Tower. On the bottom of the card it will say 2515. The 25 stands for the 25th floor, and the 15 stands for the 15th room on that particular floor. Now look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 15 to 20. There are emergency exits in both towers of the hotel. They are located on the south side, opposite the elevators. Please use these in case of a fire or other emergency. We have some special events happening this week. Our Miner's Diner is offering a special Miner's Buffet dinner this Friday and Saturday for only $20 per person. This special includes all food, not including drinks and alcohol, and shows for the night. The buffet will be available from 5 to midnight. Because of the historical significance of our hotel, there are some special rules. The first rule is that there is no smoking allowed anywhere in the building, not even in your own room. This is not only to ensure the safety and health of our guests, but also the furniture and pictures can be easily damaged by smoke and other harsh treatment. Please remember that there are items of furniture over a hundred years old here, so respect the rules by not smoking. Secondly, please do not take pictures using a flash of any of the drawings and paintings in the rooms or hallways as they are old and fragile. We are doing our best to preserve a national treasure, so please help us in doing so. Lastly, you will only have one set of towels and bed sheets per three days. This is to conserve the water supply, as there are frequent droughts this high up in the hills. If there are any further questions, the staff of the hotel will be available to answer your questions. In the event that no one is able to answer your questions, I will also be available from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. each day in the concierge. 
I hope you enjoy your stay here with us. Thank you very much. This is the end of section 2. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers. Section 3 Section 3 You will hear a conversation between two student teachers talking about our projects. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hey, Janice. Hey, Jimmy. What's up? Not much. I'm kind of worried about these lessons we have to plan. I've not worked much with children before. Oh, you don't have anything to worry about, Jimmy. All we have to do is choose a few art projects to do with the kids. Then we have to get the materials for them and do the projects by the end of the month. OK, that doesn't sound too bad then. Maybe we could get some ideas from online websites. Yep, already did that. I printed out descriptions of the best five, and I wanted to ask you what you thought. Great, yeah. Let's look over them. Here you go. Some are from a teaching website, and some are from an arts and crafts website. We can talk about what kind of materials we'll need and what would be best for our students. Hmm. The first art project here is called Make Your Own Mask. That sounds like fun. For materials, all we need are scissors, markers, stiff paper, and pieces of string. We have all those at the school already. What's the procedure again? You give everyone the stiff paper. There are some basic guidelines the kids have to follow, like where to cut out holes for the eyes and then one hole for the nose. The kids then colour in the mask any way they want, or we can ask them to create masks with a theme, like animals or something. That seems easy to do. OK, now the second project here. Yes? This one is called Shoebox Dioramas. Each student gets a shoebox and puts one long side of the shoebox into the lid. It now looks sort of like a covered theatre stage. The students then have to create a scene inside the shoebox with the materials we give them, including styrofoam and basically anything else we can think of. We can tell them to do a historical scene, or just somewhere they have been before. All right, well, what's the next one? For art project number three, we need egg cartons and pipe cleaners. What's a pipe cleaner? Pipe cleaners are basically flexible lengths of metal wire that are furry. They come in all sorts of different colours. They're very useful in crafts. For this project, you take the individual egg holder cups and stick the pipe cleaners in them to make animals. OK, that sounds interesting. The fourth art project is called Paper Bag Animal. Students can use brown or white paper bags. They decorate these bags with markers or pieces of coloured felt. They decorate the bottom of the bag when the children put their hands in the bag and hold the bag upright, it becomes a sort of puppet. We'd need quite a few paper bags. Yes, we'd need the small lunch bag kind. The grocery paper bags would simply be too large. OK, I suppose they would have them available at the corner store. Yes, it's not very green to pack lunches in them, but they're still popular to use. So what do you think of the last project? Well, this fifth project sounds fun. It's called Paper Mache Sculptures. We tear some newspapers into strips and dip them into liquid starch. The kids can choose any object to cover with the strips, like a blown-up balloon. After letting them dry, the kids can decorate the paper mache with paint. Sounds a little messy. Shall we go over them and see what's good and bad about each? Sure. 
Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. So, yeah, number one sounds really easy to do, and you mentioned that we already have all the materials, right? Yes, but I think I wanted to do something a bit more hands-on and creative. I mean, I suppose they can wear their masks and play around, but the project is just basically drawing on paper. It might be too easy. I suppose so. What do you think about number two? Well, it certainly is more creative, but do you think that is too hard? I mean, they would have to create whole scenes out of a lot of different kinds of materials. Well, I think that the kids could do it. We would have to give them a little more guidance, but you're right, it might be too difficult for them. How about number three? I did this one as a child. Yes, I tried to make egg carton creatures as well. It was quite fun, as I recall. Do you think we could get the supplies? I suppose, though unfortunately the craft store in town is closed. It might be hard. I see. Well, then, we'd have to find another way to get them if we do this project. OK. Well, what do you think of the fourth art project? Well, when I first looked at it, I thought it might be good, but you know what? Yes, what is it? Actually, I think our students may have already done this art project in another section. Oh, really? You think they have? Yes, I'm pretty sure now, actually. I don't think it'd be good to repeat it. I suppose so. How about the last project? I really like the concept, but it seems really, really messy. I mean, we have to dip the newspaper strips by hand into the starch, then wrap it around something, and finally paint the object after it dries. It sounds really fun, but there will definitely be a lot of cleanup. Well, that's too bad then. Hmm. I guess I can go online and do some more research. You know, I'll help with that too. Thanks, Jimmy. I'm sure we'll find something. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 4. Section 4. You will hear a lecture about Crocodilus niloticus and its living habits. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. Today we will continue our study of Crocodilus niloticus by talking about its living habits. We've already discussed the evolutionary attributes that set it apart from its crocodile relatives. Does everyone remember that? Yes, it has an extremely narrow snout and three or four rows of protective scales on its back as compared to two rows on other members of the Crocodilus genus. Let's take a look at how these carnivorous man-eaters live, where they live, and finally, whether they really deserve their vicious reputation. To start, I'd like to address a great question posed to me by a student during yesterday's office hours. We talked about the distribution of crocodiles in Africa and saw that they are highly concentrated in the south and west of the continent. 
This student noticed that on the map displaying the distribution of crocodiles across Africa, there were no crocodiles in the northern region, and found no mention in the literature of the existence of crocodiles in the north of Africa. Why might there be no crocodiles in North Africa? Let's save this question for later in the lecture. To find out more about the social habits of the African crocodile, one researcher named Tara Shine of the University of Ulster in Northern Ireland conducted a survey of the wetlands in Mauritania, and received reports of 46 crocodiles living in one group, or float, as we say when referring to crocodiles. Though the usual number is a little less than half of that. In general, crocodiles are more highly concentrated in wet subtropical environments near bodies of water and rich vegetation. While South American crocodiles thrive in cool rainforests, the African crocodile is more equipped for heat. Though they can survive at the hot temperatures found in some deserts, they are not equipped to handle dry climates and thus cannot survive in places like the Sahara Desert of North Africa. As cold-blooded animals, crocodiles' core temperatures fluctuate from their average of 38 degrees Celsius as external conditions change. Thus, they need to avoid extreme temperatures. Others live an underwater life. Keeping a body temperature close to that of the water, as their own unique method of regulating their body temperatures, some African crocodiles have made dens by digging holes in the ground to provide themselves with a cool, dark place to retreat from the hot African sun. Speaking of the hot African sun, let's go back to the question asked at the beginning of the lecture. We know that there used to be crocodiles in northern Africa. Yet today there are none. What are some possible explanations for this? Some students have suggested that the African crocodile has evolved from a desert creature into a wetland creature, thus causing them to migrate south for more appropriate conditions. Others presume that the crocodile was hunted out of northern Africa by a fiercer predator. While these are intelligent guesses, the real story is a little bit different. The key to this migration is that the Sahara Desert did not always cover the north of Africa. About 8,000 years ago, the land was fertile wetlands, perfect for breeding crocodiles. Over time, though, the area dried out and the wetland slowly turned to desert, leading the African crocodile to migrate south to the marshlands they call home today. Some crocodiles did, however, adapt to living in dry conditions. In Mauritania, some crocodiles have learned to survive in an area where they can go up to eight months with no water, by spending the driest of times in what's called a torpor, or short period of hibernation. To utilize every bit of rainfall, these desert crocodiles dig underground caves that collect runoff, thus staying cool and hydrated. During the mating period in November and December, males attract females to their viciously protected territory through a number of behaviors that range from snapping their jaws all the way to sending infrasonic pulses through the water. Afterwards, the female digs a hole up to 60 centimeters in depth to store the eggs for an 80-day incubation period. The female protects these eggs during the period. And sometimes even helps crack the eggs with her snout at the end. These teeth-gnashing carnivores are softer than we think. Although these vicious creatures have attacked humans on a few occasions, the residents are not afraid of them. In fact, they show a great deal of reverence towards these wondrous creatures. Some say that crocodiles bring water to their habitat, so if they leave, they will bring the water with them. Obviously, this is not true, but it demonstrates the admiration the inhabiting people have for crocodiles. Generally, crocodiles do not predate on humans. They attack when humans populate the crocodile's habitat, instilling fear and uneasiness in the crocs. Like any other species, crocodiles are known to attack when feeling fear. There's still a lot more to be discovered about the African crocodile. Researchers want to know more about the population size. How many crocodiles inhabit Africa in all? How they form separate floats, etc. There is still also much to learn about migration patterns. 
and relations to other populations of crocodiles now found in other parts of the world. Next time, we'll examine a few specific case studies of crocodile populations in southern Africa. That is the end of section 4.